I'm very happy to introduce you to Dr. Rubina Muhammad uh, as our evening speaker. Dr. Rubina uh, is a lecturer in human geography at the University of Plymouth, uh, and uh, she has done a number of uh, projects in the UK, Singapore, and uh, USA. Her research focus is on the geographies of gender. She has published on the position of young women within Pakistani Muslim communities in the UK. Her current research investigates on identity and changing identifications amongst second and subsequent uh, Pakistani Muslims in Birmingham in the context of globalization and technological change. Dr. Rubina has also set up a charity on Jasmine Leila Award, and this can be found on the RGS IBG website, the Royal Geographical Society website. The award focuses on medical and health geography, performance and transnational, co transnational communities. I would encourage you all to go and visit. Today she'll be talking about uh, position, place, and connections, and disconnections, and welcome Dr. Rubina. Thank you very much for inviting me here and giving me an opportunity to present my current research, which is very much research in, in progress at the moment, so I really welcome comments. Um, my paper that I've been working on uh, draws on an ethnographic study to explore the now well-documented shifting identifications from ethnicity to faith amongst young people of Pakistani origin in the Birmingham community. Uh, in Griot's terms, my research seeks to understand, and I quote um, Ralph Griot, um, what actually happens on the ground. Um, the subjective dimension, the ideas, models, projects, definitions, discourses, etc., that actors bring to bear on the, uh, on the situation. So what I really want, have been trying to understand is the ways in which um, this shift in uh, foregrounding faith as an identity is playing out on the ground in the lives of young Pakistanis, at least second, gen second and subsequent generation Pakistanis. Um, I'll, an additional point is that I really want to um, say here is that I favor research in context, and this is going to and it'll cause me a little bit of problem because I want to, br usually my research tries to br bring together a lot of different um, scales of experience in order to understand um, the rich complexity of lived experiences, the messiness of lived experiences, to get away from the kind of neatness of um, dominant representations and uh, discourses. Uh, and this is what I'm gonna try and do but uh, I know I won't have enough time, so just, um, just bear with me. Um, the discussion will be structured as follows. I want to begin with a framework um, for, my, for my study, um, something about the political context which, within which we have to understand the case study. Um, after, after that, I want to reflect a little bit on the methodological issues, uh, make a comment on the research field, uh, before I then outline the Birmingham community uh, of Pakistani origin to give you a sense of its, uh, something about it and its geography uh, in order f uh, to kind of contextualize the uh, case study, the experiences of the respondents that I'm going to talk about today. I then turn to the case study. Now in the written paper that, that, that this uh, talk is from, the study is in two parts. The first part focuses on what I call the respondent self locations uh, and the second part is uh, then contextualizes these self locations the ways in which respondents are constructing their identity um, uh, looking at a different axes of identity and how they uh, work together to represent them um, I want to understand this in the context of the local global nexus and the way I understand that is the is uh, what it means for me specifically is the home, the home space uh, and the home in its relationship with the homeland and um, the, the space within the locality in Britain within the wider global context. So there are different scales of um, uh, the way uh, the different scales are in articulation together to circumscribe the experiences of these young people that I'm going to talk about today. 
Questions of connection, disconnection, identity, citizenship and loyalty to Britain are once again being raised with respect to diasporic communities of Pakistani origin, particularly uh, after the events that you're all very familiar with, uh, 7th of July bombings in London, the so-called war on terror declared by the US after September the 11th uh, events in the US. Uh, it's now well documented that since the 1980s there's been a gradual shift amongst British South Asian Muslims towards foregrounding their faith over ethnicity and culture. This can be seen as part of a wider shift in the decline of secularism since the 1960s and with the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s the, his the emergence, well the strengthening of this historical antagonism between uh, the West and Islam that became more central as the US's geopolitical strategies of the 1980s culminated in the events of September the 11th. Islam began to emerge as an important axis of uh, identity for Pakistani Muslims with the Rushdie affair in the 1980s. The Rushdie affair, um, referring to the global protest by Muslims against Salman Rushdie's novel The Satanic Verses in the 1980s, brought mainstream recognition, uh, recognition for uh, British Muslims as a distinctive group. The protests facilitated the imagining of a global Muslim community, encouraging the primacy of religious identity and bringing visibility to Muslims on the global stage. This, these processes have created the conditions of possibility for the politicisation of Muslim South Asians in the UK, particularly from the early 1990s, in response to a series of global events and shifts that you'll all be very familiar with, I'm sure. Um, the intensification of what can only be described as US hubris with the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, um, ongoing conflicts such as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Kashmir issue in South Asia following um, the partition between India and Pakistan, uh, the first Gulf War uh, in 1991, uh, the um, ethnic cleansing of Bosnian Muslims uh, by Serbian and Croat nationalists, all of which went to suggest uh, uh, to, that everywhere Muslims were under siege. Thus, locally marginalised Muslims from all backgrounds were readily able to identify with and relate to what appeared to be the global oppression of Muslims, um, to link their own experiences of disempowerment in British localities with those of their Muslim brothers and sisters across the globe, in Bosnia, in Palestine, in Iraq, <coughs> and later in Afghanistan. Just as UK-based socially marginalised South Asian Muslims began to increasingly identify themselves as an imagined Muslim community and to understand their place in the world through this lens, anxieties around the loyalty of British-born Muslims to the nation became heightened. The urban disturbances of 2001 between the police and uh, neo-fascist neo movements and uh, youth of Pakistani origin in a number of northern English cities such as Brad Bradford, Oldham and Burnley were followed the same year by the global reverberations of, of the events of September the 11th and then later on by the London bombings in, in 2005, uh, which were perpetrated uh, not by overseas but by British, <coughs> uh, predominantly by British citizens, seem to confirm the status of Muslims as unruly, as outsiders. Since September the 11th then, there's been this growing tide of distrust and demonization of British Muslims. In popular and political discourses, British Muslims have been constructed as willfully segregated, both geographically and culturally, as isolating themselves, as sealing themselves off and disengaging themselves from British society. Indeed, some uh, reports have even uh, suggested that they lead parallel lives uh, in which they develop oppositional values um, that are then a threat to national security. Uh, th in this way, they are constructed as being a kind of autoimmune disease, a disease that is from within that's turning in on itself and threatening to erupt as a kind of infidel or enemy within, endangering its own nation. So concerns with these kinds of, um, uh, this kind of difference or diversity or separateness um, 
has seen a reorientation of government policy away from multiculturalism, away from the celebration of difference uh, that we were seeing earlier, uh, towards uh, concerns with integration and with community cohesion. And uh, as uh, Claire Alexander and, um, and her co-authors have argued, this has dramatically recast the framework within, issues of, uh, within which issues of ethnic difference and multiculturalism uh, in Britain are being understood. So this, this new focus on integration and so, uh, social cohesion, community cohesion, um, has seen uh, the Home Office launched a new policy for citizenship education in order to uh, encourage Muslims to act as responsible citizens, uh, to remind them of their obligations to the nation, um, and, and to promote uh, integration and community cohesion through the development of what uh, David Blunkett called, as when he was Home Secretary, shared norms, shared values, and norms of acceptability. And English language is seen, is regarded as one of the ways in which Muslims can be brought closer to modern culture, um, and thus aligning them um, with modernity and with Britishness. So Britishness is seen as uh, English is seen as symbolically part and uh, part of being what it means to be British. To speak English uh, is to be modern, is to be British. Um, and it's against this backdrop that British Muslims of South Asian origin are having to confront questions of identity and citizenship as their allegiance to the nation is called into question at a time when their relationship to their parents' homeland is also in transition. They must then reassess what it means to be young, what it means to be British, Muslim, Pakistani, men and women in Britain today, how and in what ways, when and in what ways these elements, these different elements, aspects of identity come together or configured in what kinds of constellations and, and what this means. Hussein and Baghouli's uh, research is the closest research that I found to mine. And it explores, it's explored the relationship between citizenship, identity, and national belonging as it was working out in the lives of Pakistani Muslim youth in Bradford in the aftermath of the 2001 disturbances. They contend that young Bradford-based Kashmiris express a multicultural, multi-ethnic, citizenship identity that is crucially also British, which confers on them national belonging and the same rights as white, the white British population, giving them a confidence to demand equality and justice, something which their parents, the first generation, uh, their parents and grandparents lacked. Their grandparents and parents were much more, la much more accepting of a differential treatment of inequality than these young people, precisely because they see themselves as British. Um, and at the same time, there's also this uh, perception with uh, this, this turn to this foregrounding of faith uh, rather than ethnicity. It also offers them a, a way to kind of reconcile Britishness, um, uh, which, which, they, which seem to be in contradiction with, with uh, the Pakistani ethnicity. So it offers this possibility for overcoming the supposed contradictions of cultures that are seemingly, um, of cultures that are seemingly posited as internally homogenous, as pure and oppositional, uh, summed up by the notion that you, you must be all familiar with the torn between two cultures um, idea that is all often used to explain diasporic experiences. So before um, exploring further the questions of identity and identifications among second and subsequent generation of Pakistani, uh, young people of Pakistani origin, I just want to say something about my methodology and, uh, and the research field uh, before I move on to outline um, something about the Birmingham community and its geography. So this, this study that um, I'm going to talk about today uh, was conducted by two female researchers who were from within the community under study and myself. Um, the data was gathered last um, summer, 2008. The study is based on 46 um, semi-structured in-depth interviews with British-born second and subsequent generation men and women, 23 of each, 
um, aged between 16 and 35. Uh, the majority of the uh, respondents, with only one exception, uh, were drawn from non-professional working class backgrounds. The respondents were drawn from a variety of sites, including but not restricted to sixth form colleges and um, uh, sites of higher education. Respondents were also were all individually approached by myself or the researchers uh, at or close to these sites and interviewed at the same time. Um, all interviews were recorded. Uh, given the conf importance of confidentiality, we didn't record any names or um, contact details. And the names that I use here are, are purely pseudonyms that I've given for ease of kind of understanding. Um, we also interviewed, the broader study is also informed by conversations with people who are working at community level in order to get an understanding of what's actually going on in the commu community, what issues are important in the community. And then we can place the respondents' um, uh, own understandings within that context, um, which I, I always like to get that broader context as well. Um, the research field. In Birmingham, there was a feeling of deep, deep research fatigue amongst young, uh, young people who complained vehemently about being the focus of so much intrusive attention. A general sense of being under state surveillance and fear, uh, uh, and fear of being linked to terror tactics, pervades the environment. There seemed to be a wall of silence around the issue of terrorism. There's a great deal of mistrust. As one member of the community commented to me, there is a siege mentality. People are paranoid and seek to insulate themselves not only against outsiders, but also each other. And this, so we were working in this context um, and all the difficulties that that brought with it. Um, turning to the... Um, Birmingham community now, quickly. Birmingham is Britain's second city. A massive 22% of its population is non-white, 10% uh, of which is of Pakistani origin. 9% of Britain's entire Muslim population and 16% of Britain's Pakistanis live in Birmingham. Those of Pakistani origin make up the second largest group. So after, after the, uh, the white population, um, 104,000 as opposed to just under 650,000. Uh, Birmingham's Pakistanis originate almost exclusively from the rural parts of Azad Kashmir and surrounding areas. And Kashmiriyat, which I'm not really going to talk about today very much, is, is very strong in Birmingham. Um, and also is another factor that complicates Pakistani identity. Um, the Birmingham population geographically, if you can look at the map, is very concentrated. This is a map I've uh, taken, it's uh, not actually of the... Um, uh, of the Pakistani community as such. It's just of so-called ethnic minorities. But if you look at the Washwood Heath area, if you can make out on here, uh, Washwood Heath, Sparkbrook, um, <coughs> Springfield, this, this kind of area is, is an Aston is where most of my respondents were drawn from. Uh, the Pakistani population is very concentrated, as you can see, in these areas. Uh, research indicates that there's very little outward mobility as second and subsequent generations uh, remain within the area that they grew up. And from my research, uh, I, I talked to respondents about their locality, and they all expressed that they, that they preferred to, to remain there um, for various reasons, which are going to be the topic of an, another paper. Um, while outward migration for, uh, by those of Pakistani origin has been limited, again, perhaps feeding national anxieties about you know, British Muslim social and spatial self-segregation, um, as Tahir Abbas points out, their apparent concentration in this area is, all, is, is in part reinforced by the, the, uh, the so-called process of uh, white flight as, as, as white groups uh, leave the area. And white flight, he argues, continues unabated. Um, the areas are not, um, have seen change. So um, uh, they, they've become, in recent years, they've had an influx of other Muslim groups from Africa, Asia, and Europe into parts of Spark Hill and Small Heath, um, uh, which were predominantly South Asian areas and now have become. Um, visibly different uh, to include more Somalis and more Kurds have become, in a sense, Arabized. Um, and I've, I've watched that happen because I lived in, in Birmingham for 10, 
over a 10-year period. Um, okay, I now move on to, the, uh, to a discussion um, of the self-locations of young people of, of Pakistani origin residing within these culturally more mixed, yet still predominantly Muslim areas of the city. And what, I, what I'm trying to do here is not to give you, uh, I haven't got time to really talk about everything, but I want to give you a range of, uh, the, the kind of range of articulations that young people made about regarding their sort of uh, uh, multi-layered, what I call multi-layered composite um, positions that they occupy and, and the meanings that they attributed uh, to these. So, in a sense, what I'm trying to do is to understand subjectivity. I'm trying to understand people's subjectivity. And uh, to understand, uh, understanding subjectivity is to understand where and why uh, subjects locate themselves socially and spatially, their place in the world, their worldview, which circumscribes their relationships to people and places. Subjectivities are then formulated discursively within and across a matrix of multiple, at times contradictory, yet constantly evolving discourses, and uh, a million and one different discourses. You could say that they're you know, geopolitical, political, religious, secular, ethnic, national, regional, gendered, consumerist, capitalist, um, youth um, you know, discourses. Uh, all kind of intersect and, uh, and, and circumscribe people's subjectivity. Um, subjects are hailed by discourse. They can choose to uh, affirm or resist these discourses uh, by employing other discourses. Um, so they're not bound by discourses in any way. It's not something that they're locked into. There's a choice element involved. In this way, then, subjectivity is highly fluid. It's, it's contextual, uh, contextual, it's situational, it's relational, it's tenuous, and it's necessarily incoherent. It's apparent coherence, as Judith Butler has pointed out, it is a fiction that's produced through uh, performances, through the, the stylized repetition of acts. Um, and so um, another thing to bear in mind is the ways in which um, when we talk about self-positioning, that this is always negotiated between a choice, how I locate myself, how I see myself, how I perceive myself, but how I perceive myself relates to how others perceive me as well, how others locate me, how, what's going, how the context, the situation is making me feel. So we're always conscious of how others are seeing us, and it's, it's not a one-way one thing. Um, it's, so it's a choice between that which is externally imposed or conferred on us by others or by the context or situation and that which we might insist on ourselves. So we, my respondents, and I haven't had time to go really into what kinds of questions um, uh, were asked of them, but one of the, amongst the many questions that they were asked, we asked them to consider which, if any of the following categories, Muslim, British, Pakistani, um, and or another alternative category could be said to define them and which, if any of these, was most important to them and why. And uh, remember that we made it clear to the respondents that these categories uh, were not given. They're open to interpretation, to negotiation, to reworking. And in fact, that's what we were looking for, to try and understand the ways in which respondents were understanding these categories, what these categories meant to these people. Um, the majority of respondents, uh, with only uh, a few uh, exceptions, um, f foregrounded a faith-based identity. But one thing to remember, one, one thing that was interesting was that this was never a, um, a sort of taken-for-granted assumption. And if it, if often that they gave one response and then immediately as they began to think, they had to revise it and change it. So it, it, it showed that it wasn't just something that they, um, what they originally thought wasn't, you know, what the assumptions they, they made weren't um, how they really uh, felt. Um, the apparent uh, homogeneity of their responses also concealed some differences with respect to why these were significant and what it meant, what these meant uh, for them. 
So, um, Yakub, a 16-year-old student from Alam Rock, um, immediately responded with, I'm Kashmiri. And we asked, well, why? And he said, well, because I'm from Kashmir. Uh, but when, when he was asked if, that, if he saw that as the most important aspect of his identity, he responded with a categoric no. Um, he responded with a categoric no. If someone was to ask me that, I would say Muslim. Why? Because I am Muslim. What is important is that we are all Muslims at the end of the day. We're all born Muslim. It didn't matter then, and he meant at the time you were born, if you were Kashmiri or Pakistani. We're separated into, into these groups, these ethnic groups, uh, or national uh, groups and castes and this and that later on. Hussein and Bagule um, argue that, uh, and I quote them, Islam offers an important mode of being for young Pakistanis in Britain but state that this is within the context of identities as British citizens. Thus, uh, Yacoub's faith-based subject position is foregrounded within the context of his nationality, citizenship, and geographical location within Britain. For Yacoub, faith is distinct from and not comparable to ethnicity, national belonging, or citizenship. Thus, his sense of belonging to Britain, his nation of birth, seems directly to be related to his sense of disconnection from his parents' homeland. Uh, and he said, personally, I've only been in Pakistan once and I don't like it. It's not for me. Um, do I feel I'm Pakistani? I feel more British, actually. But at the same time as declaring himself to be Muslim and British, Yacoub distances himself from Western culture, which he regards as a malign influence on Pakistanis, pushing them towards the drug culture and gang violence that he claims is rife in his area. Particularly notable with Yacoub is, that, is the pri that the primacy of a Muslim identity does not relate, as one might expect, to a greater commitment to religiosity or religious practices. As Akhtar uh, points out, to, um, points out uh, it's important to avoid conflating, uh, and I quote her, a symbolic acts of negotiating identity with a return to religiosity, unquote. Thus, when questioned on whether he's a practicing Muslim, Yacoub's response is an unqualified no, um, which I was quite surprised at because some of, a lot of the others um, sought to qualify their, their responses. Now, Fessel, um, a 22-year-old from Aston who's uh, studying at City University, also foregrounds being a Muslim. But by contrast, he doesn't identify himself as British. He explains why both religion and culture, Pakistani culture, are relevant for him and why religion is prioritized within this. I would see myself as a Muslim. Um, Pakistani is just a culture. Um, saying that, it's just the nationality. I consider myself as a Pakistani, but you can't clash. You can't just associate, and he means compare, Pakistani to Muslims. In terms of language-wise and everything, I see myself as a Pakistani. The way I'm thinking is Pakistani. I don't act like a British person more and more. Faisal then makes it explicit what remains implicit in Yacoub's response, that comparing Pakistani culture and ethnicity to faith is like comparing apples and pears, in that they're two very different things. Faisal also um, reiterates the concerns of the first generation when he opposes Britain's modern culture to that of the homeland. Um, thus, alongside his faith, um, Faisal places a greater emphasis on Pakistani values, culture, and language. This can be seen in his concern for, uh, for his future children. And a number of respondents um, seemed concerned for their future children, their children or their future children, and, and um, uh, said that they had issues about bringing their children up in Birmingham or British and or British localities. Um, but for Faisal, this concern particularly related to what he saw as the risks of living outside of the homeland, uh, concerns with the loss of culture, bearing in mind that he's been born and bred in Aston. So he's concerned about the loss of culture and the threat of, uh, of becoming white or modern. Um, as he said, you know, you don't want your children to be brought up to be proper modernized, and you don't want them to be like Gori, and you want them to know their own culture, because a lot of Pakistanis here are losing their own culture. They're turning gay, and this and that. 
You don't know how it is like, uh, like these days. They want to go clubbing nowadays, especially the girls, so it is bad. And it's a, it's a very masculinist uh, position, a very uh, paternalist and masculinist at the same time. But what's in interesting is that Fessel retains that, that alignment of white, British, and modern that I was talking about, that I touched on in the dominant, say, government, governmental discourse. Um, and, and so he, he retains that alignment, and he also retains the alignment um, and the opposition to it um, between non-white Pakistani traditions, so these two are opposed. What he does is he simply... Um, reverses it. So he remains very much within that dominant uh, discourse, but simply reversing it and rejecting the white British modern, which is what the government would like him to be, uh, perhaps not white, but British and modern, through the um, uh, increasing use of Engli English language. Um, instead, so he rejects that. Instead, he valorizes the Pakistani and the traditional and his own language. Um, so another aspect to think about is the ways in which, um, the, at the same time as retaining that um, hierarchy, and some would say that violent hierarchy, or, or reversing that violent hierarchy, um, he also retains, um, he also, his, his way of understanding these categories is equally uh, fixed and given as it is in dominant discourse, rather than fluid and negotiable, which for some other respondents they have, uh, they, um, have become. So, um, uh, to be British, and um, so for him, so for Fessel, to be British is to be, uh, to be modern, and, uh, to, uh, and both of them are aligned with being Western and decadent which is what he rejects. Yet for many respondents like Yacoub, who have foregrounded their faith as an identity, modern, while being um, aligned with Britishness, is, um, is reworked and reconciled with faith, which is what is particularly appealing to many of the respondents who do that, is that they can um, take the modern and they can make it what they want it uh, to be and, and reclaim it for themselves, um, aligning it with faith and, and at the same time rejecting Pakistani culture and uh, identity as, as traditional. Um, and, but but how, what, how to, um, what do you do with the idea of decadence when, when it's aligned with modernity, when it's aligned with being modern? Well, for Yacoub, he then he takes the westernness, he separates being modern and Western, and he attributes, to, attributes decadence to being Western rather than being modern, and then he can claim it for himself. Um, so while some respondents like Fessel are, are, are remaining very much within the dominant discourse, merely, merely reversing it, um, other respondents like Yacoub are um, kind of deconstructing it. So another respondent who... Um, who positions herself more in terms of culture, like Fessel, is development worker um, Saima. She's far less clear than Yacoub or um, Fessel about what axes of identity are important for her. And it's something that she really has to reflect on and work through. Um, my family, she kind of goes through everything. My family originate from Mirpur district, so I guess that's more Kashmiri. But personally, being born in this country, I consider myself uh, more Pakistani, so I would describe myself as uh, British, as more British Pakistani. I don't see myself as English. I wouldn't say I'm only Pakistani. The only links I have are through stories from my parents, really. I've only been when I was small and never really been back, and there's no real desire for me to go, wanting to go back. I empathize with the situation there, but I think I'm, I'm British Pakistani, and my life is here, and that's it, really. It's really complicated for me. I'm British. But for me, that means people of all different cultures living together, not necessarily in harmony because that would be anticipating a utopia. Just by looking at me, you can tell that I'm not white, but I am British, and I am Pakistani and Muslim. So um, many scholars have commented on how non-white subjects' adoption of English identity is not straightforward as it is a racialized identity. But um, historically, Englishness is a white ethnicity that has marked a different uh, distinction from Welsh identity or Scot 
Scots identity. So therefore, you could say that it is normatively referred to as a singular, uh, discrete um, ethnicity that does preclude other affiliations. And Saima therefore rejects Englishness as a mode of identity, which she implicitly associates with whiteness. But uh, importantly, she also dismisses a straightforward Pakistani identity. Um, like, Fes um, like Fessel, uh, she, Saima expresses a cultural affinity with Pakistan, but by contrast, she, does, she affirms her present and future as a British citizen. For her, religion all seems an afterthought as she continues. And then, of course, I'm Muslim too, but I wouldn't say I'm British Pakistani Muslim. I think what confuses me sometimes is to what extent I am something. For example, I am a Muslim, but am I a good Muslim? Am I a practicing one? Could I do better? But I don't really feel that about being Pakistani and British. It's just about the religion because I'm not really that practicing, but I am quite spiritual. By contrast with Yacoub, who sees no contradiction in foregrounding a religious identity despite not being a practicing Muslim, for Saima, Muslim identity is not just a matter of faith, but also practice. Implicit in her deliberations is the idea that being a Muslim is not a scribe for something to be attained or achieved. Thus, not being a practicing Muslim for Saima necessarily limits the extent uh, to which one can define themselves in those terms. Now, moving on to uh, Jamil, uh, like Saima, 23-year-old law student Jamil is one of a minority of students who doesn't foreground religion as central to their identity. And rather, he um, foregrounds his commitment to, to Britain and British identity. I think I feel more British now. Obviously, my family is Pakistani from abroad, yeah. Uh, but I personally don't feel Pakistani myself. I think I have a more, uh, more of a connection between Britain. Mm, the only connection I have of Pakistan is when I go home and my parents talk about it or make reference to it. And it's interesting that um, Jamil is actually, has, has just, he's got a one-year-old child, he's married to a, a, a girl from Pakistan. So he still, that still hasn't um, uh, made a difference to him in terms of his sense of being Pakistani. Um, and he distances himself from Pakistan by saying it's somewhere else. Um, it's abroad. It's, it's kind of nothing to do with me. Uh, he was asked about the impact of religion on the ways in which he classifies himself. I think that I'm a Muslim. I do believe in my religion, but I feel as though I kind of like, I'm not practicing, so I don't feel religious. Although I do believe in Islam, a little bit of Islam. I'm my own person, you see. It's the cultural of where I live in England that's overriding it at the moment. Jamil's much more tentative about positioning himself as a Muslim. Merely believing or having faith is not enough for him to feel religious. Um, for Jamil, as for Saima, Islam is a way of life and doing little or nothing towards practicing the faith compromises their ability to categorically position themselves as such. Uh, Jamil confesses that the overriding influences on him are not of Islam or his parents' homeland, but of Britain. His first explanation for, for a lack of religiosity is that he is an independent thinker, suggesting that he understands religion as necessarily being a prescribed and fixed set of ideas and practices that demand submission. However, he, even though he is only um, you know, one of two respondents who came close to suggesting that religion isn't important in his life, he does go on to say that you know, it's what he thinks about in his free time. Um, I would like to practice my religion a lot more, but I don't think I get the opportunity to do so in, in this society. There's too much of an overriding impact, that, uh, too much of overriding impacts that are coming available to me, meaning there's too many distractions. Thus, the other key factor in his explanation, in the explanation of his lack of religiosity, is the culture in England, which does not encourage him to be religious, but instead offers too many distractions that take him away from the rightful path. Now, like um, Salma, a 28-year-old teacher from Alam Rock, a uh, school teacher, um, she's actually adopted the hijab, and she's, one would think that then she would foreground, um, well, I, I, I would assume that she would foreground a Muslim identity. But in fact, she begins, um, uh, she talks of the impact of Britain on her religious practices and the performance of a Muslim self. And yet, she begins to define herself as a Pakistani and then revises her initial assumptions. 
Salma, like Saima, sets out to assert a more inclusive Britishness, which accommodates a Pakistani ethnicity when she states that I feel British, I feel Pakistani and British. And as she reflects, um, she starts to tentatively reassess her position and prioritizes religion. Because being a Muslim is more a way of life than the color of your skin or where you're from, which shifts. It's something that I think I am. I am a Muslim. I am British Muslim. And through this process of thought, she revises her earlier position. When in trying to ascertain how and where being Pakistani fits in uh, with, with this, uh, she's asked you know, if she feels Pakistani, to which she then responds, probably not. No, now I come to think of it. So she completely changes her mind on that. Um, unlike skin color or place of origin, um, Commitment to a faith is a conscious choice for her, something which she can control. And moreover, it offers her a sense of control, emotional security, inner strength, as well as collective empowerment confirmed by a place within the Ummah. Salma then um, also suggests that despite teaching in a Muslim majority school, she feels very, very conscious of a conflict of values between Islam and those of the other cultures that she encounters in the public space that is her uh, public sphere that is her workplace. Um, this isn't in the sense uh, that it distracts her from a religion, as with Jamil, but rather relates to her ability to express other aspects or her, a fuller aspect of her, of her Muslim identity. I don't forget who I am. I don't forget that I'm a Muslim. I don't think I ever will and let myself go like that. But it's like, for example, that if I was at home, I'd be different. And when I'm at work, I'm different because I'm very much a Muslim girl. When I'm at home and when I'm at school, I'm surrounded. Um, I'm very much a Muslim girl when I'm at home and when I'm at school. I'm surrounded by all these different cultures. I have to um, be accepting of different people. Yes, I do change when I'm with other people at work because it's just two different lives, isn't it? And although there's a majority of Mus Muslim students at her school, um, you would think that she would be able to fit in much, much easier. Um, yet the values of the school are not defined according to Islam or religion, but are secular. The Salma suggests that she not only has to consciously remember uh, that she is a Muslim, but that as a Muslim, she also has to counter her expectations of those around her. Uh, while performing... Um, while performing this identity that is racialized and demonized within discourses of nationhood and belonging in um, uh, Islamophobic Britain, albeit in this relatively insulated space, while this um, circumscribes her experiences within the public sphere to such an extent that they seem to be so distinct that they are discontinuous uh, from life at home, Yet this discontinuity that she seems to experience, one could say, isn't um, restricted to someone like Salma, who is, might see herself as visibly different or as, as, as simply very different. Um, because the private sphere, one could say, uh, for everyone, irrespective of their identity, is a space that has the potential, at least, if not the reality, uh, to offer a greater, if not you know, actually to offer a greater freedom of expression than is possible in public shared spaces. So we're all, what I'm saying is that we all are performing, um, uh, are, are different uh, in, in public sphere to what we are at home. I mean, I'm certainly not like this at home um, that I am here today. So we all kind of put on uh, a certain face. And yet Salma feels that she's the one that puts on this face because she feels uh, because it's to do with this particular identity in Britain today, in this wider context. Um, it seems to me that, um, um, that, that this, uh, the performance for her or, and, and, and perhaps for others of Islamic identities, whether they're aligned with uh, Britishness or, or Pakistaniness, or highly self-conscious stage, uh, staged acts uh, that are circumscribed by the wider social, political, and cultural context. Um, so uh, I think I need to have a five minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Well, I'll just wind up then and say that um, there's m there's a lot more. This part of the study is then contextualized within, uh, within the home space to try and understand how these experiences are being shaped by what's going on at home. The homes become, become much more South Asian 
And while the, the, the locality has become much more Muslim and less South Asian, and the second part of the paper then looks at that, looks at uh, the ways in which uh, people are uh, actually, in a sense, uh, disengaging from their connection from, from Pakistan, um, even within the home space, even though the home is becoming more South Asian. And uh, within the, 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 there's a, also a visual difference uh, in the performance of identities by these second generation South Asians within those localities. So which these visual differences are actually marked on the bodies of young, men, young women who are performing uh, blended identities, I would say. Um, and I think what, if I say a couple of points as a conclusion really, that um, um, the study I think shows above all that you can't really make any easy assumptions about what this shift amounts to, what it means, uh, what it means for even, you can't take for granted if someone is performing a Muslim identity, what it means for them. And uh, what, and this is, uh, I think this is working itself out. It's not, it's too early to really make, uh, uh, make strong um, decisions about what we can, what we can say. It's, it's, it's very much a process that's evolving and that's, that's um, what, I, what I got from the, from the respondents. But one thing, the, the second thing to, to say, and the final thing, I'll be quiet after that, is to say that it struck me the ways in which the respondents were, uh, their identifications were very much an effect of uh, uh, dominant representations and uh, discourse because they saw themselves very much uh, in, the, in that racialized mode of being very different, even though we could say um, you know, that, that those differences that they, that they talk about are reinforced in their everyday practices, uh, in their confrontations with uh, racism and racial harassment, uh, at the same time as, as the, the broader represent, national representations of them and their communities. So, um, uh, that I was very conscious of that, that their interpretation, that there was some um, deconstruction, as I, as I mentioned, of, uh, of the dominant representations, of dominant discourses, but predominantly they saw themselves, the other, there were so many other ways in which they could have uh, seen themselves or represented themselves, and yet it, it, they mostly did so in, in this, in, as you know, as kind of racialized subjects. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Robina, for that very, very interesting lecture. It's, it's only that I promised you it's going to last more than 45 minutes. <laughs> I was almost tempted to let it go on. Uh, uh, so can I open up the floor for uh, questions? Yes, the, um, people did mention Kash Kashmir as, a, as an identity, but I think, I think what struck me, um, and some people even said they weren't Pakistani because they were Kashmiri, that that, 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 that wasn't even part of Pakistan. 
So I think, I wonder if it's to do with the fact that there is a political presence there that people are aware of and that has an effect. But um, I wonder overall, uh, I'm interested in the, this sort of disconnection from the homeland in general that is going on, which is very remarkable considering the, the fact that most, uh, well, the respondents all said that the, the homeland the, the was very much present in the home in Britain in, in much more strongly than, than it ever has been before in terms of the, the news coverage that they're watching, they're watching Geo, they're watching, you know, that's, that's what is viewed at home, particularly by the women. And a lot of these young people, um, well, many of these young people are married to people first, you know, first generation from Pakistan. So, I'm, I mean, it's something that I'm really interested in is what, how, why is that happening? Why are they not really interested even though they have these links? And I'm wondering if it's just the moment because perhaps it's a stage in the life cycle where when, as they get older, because they have this as a resource, they have these really strong links uh, with, uh, with Pakistani localities. In fact, Pakist Pakistani localities are becoming little Birmingham's and little Bradford's. So um, my feeling is, uh, and it'd be interesting to wait and watch, is are they going to, this is a resource that, that, that is there for them. And at some point, perhaps, you know, um, as they get older, they may want to, they may need it and they may pick it up and participate and draw on it. Um, I, I've seen some of that happen, but, uh, but it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, the first issue about class, I was very, very struck that nobody mentioned class. And that I was, class or gender, nobody mentioned it. And this is what I was saying about seeing themselves in, a, in very much the effect of dominant representations because, um, you know, why, why? Why are people seeing themselves at you know, we gave them we gave them some categories, but we said, you know, how do you and, we, and in a discussion to try and get them to talk about broadly, not just give a label. They did give labels, but not just that to try and understand a little bit more where they were coming from, and and yet that didn't that didn't come out. Um, with respect to what do you um, how do you label yourself? Um, most, a lot of them didn't want to be um, called Pakistani because they said they were British. <coughs> Some of them did. Faisal, for example, in this one, he wanted to be called Pakistani. He valorized Pakistani culture. He valorized the place. Some of them didn't valorize the place but wanted the culture. Um, but I think, I wonder if it's related to, I mean, I did some work on Indians um, when I did this work on Bollywood, and I, and I found that um, as 
the uh, perception of India and the rise of India as a global, as, a, as a, an economic power um, took place, young Indians who formerly might have not wanted to see themselves as Indians suddenly began to be proud of being Indian. I mean, at the same time, they were being wooed by India to come and, you know, there's a national uh, sort of diaspora day in India where they encourage young Indians from all over the world, you know, we're a global family, we're all Indians together, come over here and give us your money kind of thing. Um, so suddenly people are proud to be Indians, and I wonder if the converse is true, because I, a lot of people were very critical of Pakistan and its, um, the political situation, very disillusioned. I mean, I'm hoping to bring out a touch of that in the pa this paper, although it's getting too long. Um, and I think that that could be one of the reasons why, even when they identify with the culture, they don't want to be, then they s stress that it, they are British. So sometimes it becomes a second, it's a sort of British, Pakistani. Sometimes it's just British Muslim because I don't, I mean, in Jamil's one where he says that that's abroad, yeah. I mean, he immediately distances himself. It's somewhere else. It's, you know, how is it relevant to me? And a lot of the, what you were saying about, you know, I don't even speak Urdu, the respondents, all of them said they, they weren't comfortable uh, or particularly competent in, in their uh, parents' language. So, and, the, and at, at home, they're also speaking English. The only exception is that they will not speak English with their parents because it's a sign of disrespect kind of thing. But they will, um, so however, whatever kind of language they can speak, they will speak to their parents in their own language. Um, very few said that they really wanted to retain the language or the, or the culture for their children. Um, and I was quite struck by that because some years ago I felt that the, the, the continuing emphasis on uh, marriage in Pakistan, this co sort of intercontinental marriages, that that would keep people much closer to, um, to the homeland, and yet it, it doesn't seem to have had an effect. I don't know whether it's to do with the wider context um, of what's going on in Britain and, and so on. Um, I, I mean, that, that, that was the idea because there's been a lot, there is a lot of um, literature out there which talks about the broader trends. And what I wanted to find out was how they were at that level, uh, micro level of what, how they, these were playing out, what they actually meant. And yes, it is open-ended and it, is, it isn't easy to make a single statement about it and it is ongoing, but it's still that still has some value and it's, uh, to me, it's still revealing. So although, you know, it can be put into the wider context of what the trends are, but then it sort of ha illuminates um, aspects of those. It kind of brings another light onto those that those broad sweeps don't do. That's the idea. Yeah, I agree, and I think I think that this particular community is very much shaped by um, its size as well, and its and its locality. And what I'm trying to do, and I haven't been able to bring it really out today because of the lack of time, is to try and understand it within its locality um, uh, before you can look at other communities and make that comparison. And perhaps the, it, the a comparison can be made with the Bradford community because they share. Um, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the features. Um, but, and one of them is that 
this is a bigger community, it's well established, it's got certain characteristics. I couldn't really do justice to it today. But um, in the wider paper, I really look at the localities in more detail. I talk about their experiences within the locality. And all of which uh, will go to understanding their responses. And that's, that's what I'm really trying to do. I'm trying to really understand these people and their experiences, rather than just broad <laughs> trends, because there, there's other data that shows that. <laughs>